15 minute or less lecture series, Human Anatomy, Chapter 2, Cells. Cells! This is a lovely cartoon of a cell. It does show us things like the cilia, the flagellum, and microvilli, which can be found on some cells. However, it's worth to point out that any cell will have either one of these or none of them. So remember that. Only one of these or none of them. Cells are what make up all living things. They're the smallest unit of light and they, uh, light, and they arise from other living cells by cell division. Part, main parts of a cell include the plasma membrane, the structure that separates the inside of the cell from the outside world, the cytoplasm, everything between the nucleus and the uh, plasma membrane, and the nucleus itself. The plasma membrane is a lipid bilayer. That means it has two layers of phospholipids, where their fatty acid chains are facing inside, away from the fluids, and their phosphate heads are facing outside toward the extracellular fluid or the cytosol inside the cell. Phospholipids have a charged hydrophilic phosphate group, hydrophilic, water-loving, and the long fatty acid chains that are uncharged, nonpolar, and hydrophobic, water-fearing. This thereby makes this molecule amphipathic because it has both a hydrophilic portion and a hydrophobic phobic portion. They also allow for selective permeability. Many things cannot pass through that hydrophobic barrier. Large materials and charged materials cannot pass through the cell, uh, plasma membrane, while small nonpolar materials can, as well as water. Uh, other structures found in the plasma membrane include cholesterol, found embedded with the fatty acid chains. You also find uh, glycolipids. These are lipids that have, have fatty acid chains and a carbohydrate group facing out toward the extracellular fluid. You also find glycoproteins that have carbohydrates attached to them facing out to the extracellular fluids. These proteins can be integral proteins, meaning they're embedded in the plasma membrane. And if they go all the way through from one end to the other, they're also referred to as transmembrane proteins. And then the other set of proteins are the peripheral proteins, proteins that just bind to the surface of the plasma membrane. Functions of membrane proteins include allowing some things to pass through the membrane. Protein, a transmembrane protein could act as a channel that allow things to pass through the membrane that normally cannot. The membrane proteins can be enzymes that can catalyze specific chemical reactions that are important, especially in your cell membrane. Uh, they can act as attachment sites to attach to neighboring cells, to the proteins on the neighboring cells, plasma membranes. They can also be cell identity markers. Those carbohydrates of the glycoproteins and glycolipids can be recognized by our immune cells so that uh, we don't have an immune response against our own cells. Such a permeability, as I said, allows some things to pass through, mainly small nonpolar molecules and water. Uh, this can occur by passive transport, where things move along the concentration gradient from high concentration to low or along their electrical gradient from, say, positive area to a negative area, or a negative charged thing to a positive area. Opposites attract in electrochemistry. And the best, best thing about passive transport is there is no energy required from the cell. So here's diffusion, lots of dye in the droplet, high concentration, none in the water, so low concentration, so the dye will spread out from high concentration to low. So, we can get diffusion across the cell membrane for lipid-soluble solutes. We can also get diffusion of water across. When that occurs, it's referred to as osmosis. So, the movement of water from high to low amounts of water is osmosis. We also get facilitated diffusion, where transmembrane proteins will allow for some molecules to move from high concentration to low. And then there's active transport. Active transport moves materials against the concentration gradient, so from low concentration to high, or against the electrical gradient, so a positive charged ion can move toward a positive area. And, of course, it requires energy in the form of ATP. So we can have transmembrane proteins that use energy from ATP to move some substance from a low, high, low concentration, say inside the cell, to a high concentration outside or the reverse. Great way to get rid of nasty wastes. 
uh, or it can be bulk transport using vesicles. Endocytosis is when a vesicle is formed around a substance and pulled into the cell, so that substance is now in the vesicle. Endocytosis can be penocytosis for fluids, phagocytosis for large solid objects, or receptor-mediated endocytosis, where receptors help to attract only specific substances to be pulled in. Exocytosis is where the vesicle is formed inside of the cell, moves to the membrane, fuses with the plasma membrane, and then releases its contents outside of the cell. Cytoplasm, everything between the nucleus and the plasma membrane. It has the fluid, the cytosol, which is the fluid of the cytoplasm, including things dissolved in the fluid. There's the organelle, specialized structures, and the cytoskeleton, protein rod form structures throughout the cytoplasm. The cytoskeleton the, forms these long protein filaments that can run along the surface of the plasma membrane or can go all the way throughout the cell. It serves as scaffolding to get the cell structured, allow the cell to change shape and move. And it also acts as a highway inside the cell, moving vesicles around inside the cell. There are three main kinds of filaments. There's the microfilament, super small, made of actin proteins. Helps in shape and reshape of the cell and also gives it mechanical support. There's the intermediate filaments, which are a little larger. They come from all kinds of different kinds of proteins and they help to anchor organelles in place and also help to attach cells to other cells. And then the microtubules, the largest of the filaments made by tubulin proteins. They can help determine the cell shape. They can help act as a highway to let things move around inside the cell and they can also move chromosomes during cell division. They also can help to form cilia and flagella, which are structures of the plasma membrane that's formed by the microtubules, cilia to move materials outside of the cell, and flagellum to move the cell itself, which is of course only found in sperm cells. Ribosomes. Ribosomes are uh, protein and RNA organelles that produce proteins, protein synthesis. They can be free-floating in the cytoplasm or bound to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The rough endoplasmic reticulum and smooth endoplasmic reticulum make up the endoplasmic reticulum. They are interconnected membranes extending from the nucleus and going through the cytoplasm. The rough endoplasmic reticulum, as you can see here, have little bumps on them. Those are the ribosomes. And a rough ER is where the synthesis of proteins, glycoproteins, and phospholipids occur. Uh, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum has no ribosomes. It synthesizes fatty acids and steroids and can inactivate some harmful substances, which in case of taking some drugs can lead to drug resistance. The Golgi complex is a layer of, of pancake-shaped layers of a membrane that are very important for extracting uh, vesicles from the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then packaging and modifying proteins found in those vesicles and then sending them out either to other organelles or to the plasma membrane to be part of the plasma membrane or to be secreted outside of the cell. So here is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It makes its specialized proteins. They go by vesicle to the Golgi complex, which then continues to modify them and sort them out and then sends some of them to be uh, excreted, some of them to be part of the plasma membrane, and some to be their own organelles. Lysosomes, specialized vesicles that carry out digestion. They break down things, especially things that have been brought into the body through uh, endocytosis. Uh, lysosomes can digest substances, carry out autophagy, aka recycle old organelles, implement apoptosis, that's programmed cell death, and also release their contents extracellularly to digest things outside of the cell. Pisaxis is a genetic disorder where there's a non-functioning protein, and this causes this severe effect of fatty accumulation in nerve cells, leading to the degradation and death of children by the age of four who have this disorder. Peroxisomes are specialized vesicles filled with enzymes for neutralizing free radicals and hydrogen peroxide. And they also can break down toxins like alcohol and oxidize fatty acids and amino acids. Proteus Proteasomes are tiny, tiny protein organelles that break down proteins that are no longer needed and turning them back into their amino acid components. Mitochondria are these double membrane structures that produce ATP. 
the energy used by the cell. Um, this process of AT production is through cellular respiration and needs oxygen. That's why we breathe in and produces carbon dioxide, the waste we have to breathe out. The nucleus. The nucleus is the largest organelle and it stores our genetic information in the form of DNA. Uh, if you look at the nucleus, it has the nuclear envelope, a double membrane structure that has large nuclear pores to allow large structures to pass in and out. Within the nucleus will be the nucleolus, an organelle that makes the components of ribosomes, as well as the DNA. But the DNA isn't naked. Instead, it is found coiled up in the form of chromatin, which is a DNA protein complex. Um, here's another view. You can see the uh, nuclear pores, nuclear envelope, double layer, the chromatin, and how the rough endoplasmic ER is formed off of the nuclear envelope. DNA is a double helix that stores information in the form of genes. There's, each gene codes for a specific protein, and there's about 30,000 different genes in the human genome. Um, it gets bound up to histone proteins, wrapped around those proteins to form the chromatin. And when cells divide, chromatin will condense down to form chromosomes, which are two sister chromatids, two sides, two sister chromatids connected at the centromere. Again, chromosomes only show up during cell division. Cell cycle, the cell has its interface phase where it is alive and active and doing the things the cell must do, and the mitotic phase where the cell undergoes division. So many cells will enter the G1 growth phase where they will grow from being smaller cells to their proper size. Some will leave the cell cycle to only do what they do and never divide again. Others will enter the S phase where they'll duplicate their DNA. And then uh, the DNA is split open. It's a double helix that's split open, and each chain, each side, will then act as a template for a new chain to be built on it. Give us two copies. Uh, then during the G2 phase, the cells will get extra big, so they're ready for division during the mitotic phase, which includes mitosis, the division of the nucleus, and cytokinesis, the division of the cytoplasm, to get two identical cells. You have per, uh, interphase, G2, where you have two copies of the centrosomes, the nucleus, just as we expect. Prophase, the nucleus breaks down, the chromatin becomes chromosomes, and the centrosomes go to opposite sides and start to produce the mitotic spindles. Then during metaphase, the chromosomes line up at the middle of the cell, the metaphase plate, and the mitotic spindles attach to the centromeres of the chromosomes. During anaphase, the chromosomes will be ripped apart, each chromatin going to an, chromatid going to an opposite side. And then finally, the telophase will occur where the nucleus will begin to reform. Uh, the cell will continue to divide its cytoplasm via this extending cleavage furrow, aka cytokinesis, and we get two brand new cells with identical DNA. Ta-da, two new cells, identical DNA. Cancer is the uncontrolled cell division. This is caused by the collection of mutations. First, the cells divide harmlessly and form large or small benign tumors, but they'll continue to get mutations until they become malignant, invade surrounding tissues, and metastasize, go to other parts of the body, and often lead to disruptions in those parts of the body and death. Meiosis is when a cell is divided into four new cells, each with only half of the Chromosomes. So we go from having 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs, to only 23 chromosomes and no pairs. In meiosis, the final four cells are all genetically different from the parent cell and from each other, giving us egg cells, oocytes, and sperm cells. And they also mix up the DNA during the meiosis process, making sure that crossing over occurs where chromosomes split and share portions, and also chromosome segregation, so maternal and paternal go to different cells giving us very distinct four haploid cells. With cellular diversity, all our different cells have the same DNA, if they have DNA, but they express different genes, only some of the 30,000 genes. The nerve cells produce, expressing the nerve proteins, smooth muscle cells, the smooth muscle proteins, and so on. Hope you enjoyed that lecture.